Hey gang, it is Wednesday, and so it's time for a little Bible talk. Uh, we have finished up the book of Colossians, and so we are going to be starting something new. And um, I've struggled with a way to say what this new thing is in a few words, and I think mostly I'm just going to have to show you what we're talking about. Uh, but I want to spend some time talking about the nature of God, like God's character. And I don't want to spend uh, time talking about it in an overly broad sort of way, but I want to share with you something particularly that I've noticed, a theme that runs through Scripture about uh, one particular facet of God's character, which will become clear as we go along. And um, as we're going along, I want to go ahead and encourage you to start, and we'll talk about this explicitly uh, as we go along as well, probably more towards the end of the study. I want you to be thinking about what it means for us to be people who follow the sort of God that we're going to see in Scripture. What does it mean to belong to him to take up his agenda to go out into the world uh, because it has some I think scripture in this instance has some very definite things to say about God and who God is and how God works and how God thinks about things and that ought to have a bearing on the way we do things now at first some of this some of you will have heard before uh, this is uh, in part, some stuff that we touched on, I think, briefly when we were going through in the Sunday morning class a couple of years ago now, uh, the book of Exodus. We're going to start in Exodus, but then we're going to expand beyond Exodus, both going back into Genesis for a little while and then going on through the Old Testament into the New Testament to um, talk about this particular facet of God's character. And so let's just jump right into it. I want to talk some about Exodus today to kind of set the stage and show you why I think this is important and why it's worth talking about. And uh, just to give you a running summary, the beginning of the book of Exodus happens centuries after the end of Genesis. And at the end of Genesis, of course, this is when uh, Joseph is sold into slavery, goes down into Egypt. Then he rises through the ranks to become Pharaoh's right-hand man. He helps Israel, or Egypt rather, through um, the years of famine. And uh, he brings his family to Egypt. He is given this land in Egypt for his family. And they begin to, over this intervening period, grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And so Exodus begins centuries later with a Pharaoh who had forgotten, the text says in Exodus chapter 1, about what it was Joseph had done for Egypt. And uh, rather than honoring Joseph's contribution to the life and the history of Egypt, what he sees rather is a growing group of pe people who are not Egyptians. Uh, they are not from there. As a matter of fact, the term that they are called by is Hebrew, which um, there's some debate about what that term Hebrew means. Uh, a lot of scholars think it means something like those from beyond the river. Uh, the impetus, or the implication rather there, seems to be uh, something like those people who aren't from here. Um, we used to live in Lincolnton, Georgia, and in Lincolnton, Georgia, there were those who were considered NFL and those who were FL. Went into the library for the first time there after we moved there to get a library card, and somebody looked at me and said, you're NFL, aren't you? And I said, well, I know I'm big, but I don't don't play football. Mom would never let me. She's afraid I'd get hurt. Um, so no, I never made it to the NFL. They said, no, 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 NFL is not from Lincolnton. And so no matter what you did, no matter... Um, sort of contribution you brought to the town. You were always either from Lincolnton or not from Lincolnton. And Exodus 1 starts with um, a situation in which the Hebrews, the descendants of Israel that Joseph brought down at the end of Genesis, uh, they were Hebrews, those from beyond the river. You're not from here. Uh, they were immigrants. They were strangers. They began as refugees, but they were foreigners nonetheless, and the Egyptians saw them as something different. And particularly in Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh sees them as a threat. His observation is that they were growing at a rapid pace, and that if um, the Israelites uh, found themselves in a situation where they could side with Egypt's enemies, they could help Egypt's enemies overthrow Egypt. And so and so uh, they became, for Pharaoh, a national security concern. You know, this is a group of people that could side against us. And so he enacts a series of policies in Exodus chapter 1, kind of an escalating series of policies in the interest of national security. So first what he does is he enslaves the Israelites. He figures that if he works them hard enough, the uh, indication implication seems to be that that they will uh, slow the birth rate, right? 
that doesn't work. And so eventually what he does is that he enacts a policy that calls upon all patriotic, loyal Egyptians, proud to be a part of their country, to take up Hebrew baby boys particularly and throw them in the river. He enacts a policy of genocide and calls on the Egyptian people to participate in this policy of genocide. And it's worth noting that throughout this, as uh, these policies are being enacted, it says the Egyptians were looking on the Israelites with fear and with dread. Uh, it's one of the things we've been talking about off and on for a while now, that in a broken world, um, the story really is death leading to uh, um, cycles of fear and accusation and power. They were afraid of the Israelites, and so they enacted power over the Israelites and so by the time we come to the end of chapter 2, and this is uh, when, when Moses has um, been born, uh, his mom and his sister Miriam, they uh, conspire to save him. She puts him in the bull, bulrush basket in the Nile River. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter sees him. Moses grows up in Pharaoh's court. Moses kills the Egyptian slave master. All of this is familiar story to you. Um, then um, then Moses flees to the land of Midian. All of this is going on. Moses is married to Zipporah. They've had a son. And then we come down to the end of chapter 2 in the book of Exodus. And this is where I want to start our discussion tonight. All of that has just kind of been leading up to that. Um, it says, starting in verse 23 of Exodus chapter 2, he says, After a long time the king of Egypt died. And the Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out and out of the slavery their cry for help rose up to God and God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham Isaac and Jacob and God looked upon the Israelites and took notice of them and so here I want you to see kind of the first um, the first time that God is explicitly like in a serious way brought into this text and I want to think about how you, you emphasize things in a, a story type situation, because this is a narrative. Exodus is telling a story. And one of the ways that you emphasize things when you come into a story, one of the ways you draw attention to it and say, hey, this part is important, pay attention here, is through repetition. And so we're reading along. God comes into the story in a serious way for the first time in the text. And we notice this repetition. It just kind of jumps out at you if you're reading closely, paying attention to the text. Um, the Israelites groaned under their slavery. And then at the end of that sentence, they cried out. And then in the next sentence, out of the slavery, out of the slavery, their cry rose up to God. And then the next sentence, God heard their groaning. And so in three sentences, we have one two, three, four instances of this notion of groaning or crying as the Israelites um, cry out of, they groan out of the darkness of the situation they find themselves in. And the text is wanting us to pay attention to this. The text wants us to, to catch this. They're groaning, they're crying. By the way, did I mention they're groaning, they're crying? And it doesn't do a lot more with it just then. But it just simply notes that they are groaning, they are crying out. Out of their slavery, they cry out up to God. Their cries rise up to God, and God hears their groaning, and God takes note. Um, God sees them and hears them in the darkness of their situation. And so that's kind of the first plank we want to put down on this platform. Now you have this, this emphasis at the end of chapter 2. In the darkness of the Israelite situation, that they are groaning and they are crying, and their cry rises up to God, and God takes note. And so kind of the hanging implication out of the end of chapter 2 is that God is getting ready to do something. He remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, that covenant, among other things, was that um, they would go a period of time um, in Egypt and then God would draw them back into the promised land so chapter 2 uh, sets us at this precipice this edge of action right and so then we go on into chapter 3 it just kind of leaves us hanging there Moses is in Midian he's tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro and as he's out in the wilderness tending the flock he comes across this burning bush and um, 
is burning but is not being consumed. Moses thinks this is interesting. So he walks up to check out what's going on. And when he does, he realizes that um, the Lord is speaking to him. Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. So on and so forth. And so Moses has this conversation in chapter 3 with God at the burning bush. And what God essentially says is what we kind of assumed would happen at the end of chapter 2. I'm getting ready to act. I've remembered my covenant. Um, I've remembered my covenant. I'm getting ready to act. And uh, look at what he says in verse 7. This is uh, as Moses comes up to the bush. Um, the bush calls out to him, Moses, Moses, Moses says, Here I am, back up in verse 4. Verse 5, Come no closer, remove the sandals of your feet for the place in which you're standing. It's holy ground. Verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then in verse 7, listen to what he says. And the Lord says, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. taskmasters. And indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I've also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so notice the language that he uses there. Their cry has risen to me. I have heard their cry, and having heard their cry, I look and I see their plight, he says, and now I'm going to act, and you're going to be my agent in that. I want you to go to Egypt, and I want you to bring the people out. Um, we go on down just a little bit further, and I'm, I'm going to kind of just jump back and forth here, and I'm scrolling through my phone. I don't have my actual Bible with me. Um, so it might take me for a second to find it. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, let's just not worry about that part right now. I will find it. We'll pick up on it last week. In my Bible, it's one of those situations where I could turn straight to it, but since I just have my phone with me, uh, it's not going to work all that well. Um, so we have God using this language. Um, we have God using this language uh, that he hears the cry, and hearing the cry, he looks and he sees, and now he's going to act. And so this notion that we picked up on at the end of chapter 2 shows up again in chapter 3. And um, then Moses starts giving these excuses. Oh, here we go. Uh, Moses starts giving these excuses starting in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3. I'd scroll too far down. Phones are fun. Uh, verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3, Moses gives this excuse, you know, if I come to them and say, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What am I supposed to say? And in the biblical story of starting in verse 14, this is a, a huge turning point uh, because, as you probably already know, God has a variety of names in the Old Testament, and uh, he's called by a variety of things in the New Testament as well. Um, but this is one of the big ones. This is where, you know, Moses says, who am I supposed to say sent me? And God says, the I am who I am sent you. And in Hebrew, this is this is the name where, you know, you probably grew up hearing stories about how they, the Jews wouldn't pronounce the name of the Lord for fear of taking it in vain. The, the name that all of that is about is this name, the I am who I am. It is, um, depending on uh, how you grew up, you probably heard it as Yahweh or uh, Jehovah or something like that, and we're not real sure how to pronounce it because um, it could have been either of those ways. Uh, but in your Old Testaments, in your English translations, most of them, you will notice that every now and then you're reading along and you'll talk about the Lord. The Lord says, or the Lord did, or the Lord heard, or in this case, the Lord saw. And you'll notice that um, the word Lord is in all capital letters. And um, that is an indication, that is a grammatical indication, that this is the name of the Lord being given in Exodus chapter 3, the I am who I am. When it says Lord in all capital letters, the Hebrew word there is Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever 
uh, this is the name that God gives them. And so let's spend just a minute thinking about this name that Moses uh, learns about God. He says, uh, before this time, everybody knew me by another name, but now you will know me by this name, Jehovah, Yahweh, I am. And uh, the I am, you know, we've done this spill before. The I am is the God who is present. He is um, the God not the God who will be, not the God who was, but he is the God who is here now. So at any given point, you know, you think about present tense at any given point, you say, uh, who is God? And he is, I am, he is present. He is the God who is there. And so we might ask a question. And I think the text wants us to ask this question. We, we should ask this question. Um, when God is present, what does God do? do? What does it mean for God to be present? And that's an important question because we we in our tradition have answered that in a variety of different ways. I still think of that song that we sang when I was a child, uh, be careful little hands what you do. Be careful little feet where you go. Be careful little mouths what you say. Be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little eyes what you see. And then the, the following line in all of those verses is because the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful. Um, that emphasizes the fact that God is present, right? And it says that he's looking down in love, but the, the impact of that song was always something a little different than the loving father looking down. Um, you best not mess up because God is watching. And so depending on what we do with saying God is present, no matter what moment, no matter where we are, no matter what's going on to say that God is present, depending on what we do with that, it makes an enormous difference for the way that we see God. And the book of Exodus um, has a lot to say about what it means for God to be the God that is present, the I am, to be Jehovah or Yahweh or the Lord. Um, and so one of the things that we see, and we get hints of this in chapter 2 through what he's doing, and we get hints of this by the way the story is told in chapter 3, but it's going to become explicit here in a minute is that very closely tied to this notion of God being the God who is present, the I am, uh, the one who is here, is this notion of hearing and seeing us as we cry out of and groan out of the darkness of the situation we find ourselves in. There are those who cry out of the darkness, who are groaning under oppression, like the Israelites um, being oppressed by the Egyptians. And... The text goes to great lengths to say, God sees you, God hears you, God is going to act in that situation. And so we see it kind of in action in chapter 2. Uh, they cried out, and they groaned, and they cried out, and he heard their cry. And uh, he, hearing their cry, looked and saw, and he took notice. We see it in chapter 3, I want you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go because um, I have heard their cry and I have seen their oppression and so I am going to act in the face of hearing their cry and seeing their oppression. Okay, well you want me to go. Who do you want people to say is sending me? The God who is present is the one who is sending you. The I am who I am. They haven't known me by this name before, but they're going to know me by this name now. I'm going to be acting by my name, the God who is present, the God who is here. And the implication is that the God who is here is the one who sees and hears and acts. And so, as we go on from there, it's kind of Exodus chapter 3, Moses goes back into Egypt, and he starts to confront Pharaoh, and they enter into this kind of this match of magical powers, uh, as the magicians would see it, or God's power from Moses' perspective, this, this match of miracles. And by the time we get to the end of um, Exodus chapter 5, um everything is falling apart. Um, Pharaoh is not listening to Moses and uh, he's actually made things harder on the people. You know, if you have time for this tomfoolery, then obviously we're not working you hard enough and we need to give you more work to do. And so the situation now that Moses has arrived on the scene, let my people go, the God who is present says, let my people go, um, is actually worse than it was before. 
the people are kind of wondering why Moses has come in and messed up an already bad thing to make it worse. And so we come to the beginning of chapter 6. This is Exodus chapter 6. Um, and starting in verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said, and notice there that Lord, and you'll notice this throughout all of this text, uh, it's everywhere in Exodus, the Lord is in all capital letters, Then the God who is present said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Indeed, by a mighty hand he will let them go. By a mighty hand he will drive them out of his land. God also spoke to Moses, and he said to him, I am the Lord. I am the God who is present. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, the God who is present, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they resided as aliens. I have also heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are holding as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I am the God who is present, and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a mighty axe of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord. I am the God who is present, your God, who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. I am the God who is present. And then Moses goes out and he tells the Israelites and they struggle in the story of Exodus goes on. Um, there's another literary device, like a storytelling device that's going on here. It's called, and you don't necessarily need to remember this part, just learn to be on the lookout for these things because the Bible uses them all the time. It's called an inclusio. And an inclusio is where you begin or and you end a section of a story with the same sort of statement. Uh, kind of like uh, twin pieces of bread, a sandwich, it kind of bookends the story. And what inclusios do is they give you a clue as to what that part of the story is about or what that part of the speech is about or what this poem is about or whatever kind of literature it is. They said, this is a way of focusing in on the meaning of it. And one of the things you'll notice is that in um, Exodus chapter 6, God begins and ends this speech and sprinkles throughout this speech uh, these repeated statements, I am the Lord. I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the God who is present. He begins it with, I go tell them, I am the Lord, I am the God who is present. And he ends it with, I am the Lord, I am the God who is present. And in between what the God who is present is doing is seeing and hearing and remembering and acting to bring freedom to those who were oppressed and enslaved. And so um, three times in the first six chapters, we have this, this notion crop up in Acts, uh, Exodus chapter 2. God, they cry out and they groan, and in their crying out of their slavery, God hears them and takes notice. He takes notice of their groaning. There's that repetition of their crying and their groaning out of the darkness, and God seeing and hearing, taking notice, preparing to act in the darkness. In chapter 3 of the burning bush, um, he tells Moses, I want you to go because I've seen and I've heard and we're going to act because I have seen and I have heard. And then when Moses goes to act, we, um, and by the way, in chapter three, that's where he come, he gives him this name. I am the Lord, um, the God who is present. And then we come to chapter six, kind of at the beginning of God actually acting and it's not going so well. So he says, I want you to go tell the Israelites that I am the Lord. I am the God who is present and I will, or I have seen, I have heard. I am acting, I will liberate, because I am the Lord. And so particularly what we see is we see this, this, this pattern forming. Um, that God is a God who sees and hears our plight in the darkness. Uh, those who are in, in the darkness, those who are oppressed, those who are on the bottom of the pile, those who cry out of the darkness, God is present with them. And from there, what the story goes to great pains to say is that God, when he sees and hears this cry, he takes notice and then he acts because of his seeing, hearing, and taking notice. Uh, but what's more interesting, and I think what strengthens this, is the way that it sets it up in chapter 3 and chapter 6 particularly. Because in uh, both of those texts, this notion of God seeing and hearing and taking notice and acting 
is tied explicitly to God's name, the I Am, Jehovah, Yahweh, the God who is present. It is his emphasis, uh, I think most clearly in chapter 6, but also in chapter 3, that a fundamental um, a fundamental unshakable part of what it means for God to say that his name is Jehovah Yahweh of his character of who he is in his essence is to say that he is the God who sees and hears takes notice and acts to bring liberation to people this is fundamentally who God is and so that's what I, I want to kind of start with that thought I want to leave you with that this week kind of setting the stage in Egypt because from from this point forward that's what God's going to do having heard their cry, having seen their oppression, he answers that cry by entering into the darkness and going to war with the powers that be over the Egyptian forces. And he liberates those who cried out, those whom he heard, those whom he took notice of. He liberates them from uh, their situation. This is exactly who he says he is in Exodus chapter 6. This is exactly who he says he is in, in Exodus chapter 5. It is a fundamental component of God's character of who he is and so what I want to do is I want to start here this is kind of where I first noticed it so I want to uh, trace out this pattern of God's character in this particular thing God is the God who is present and being present he hears and he sees the cries and the oppression that come out of the darkness and having seen and heard he is going to act to bring liberation from that darkness and what we're going to discover is that that theme shows up everywhere from Genesis chapter 4 all the way to the end of Revelation and uh, in some really big ways everywhere in between. And so the question I want you to be asking uh, in the back of your mind wrestling with, which we'll talk about explicitly later as we go through this, is um, what does it mean in our world to follow this God? If this is an essential part of who God is, what does it mean to follow this God? How does it change our life? The way we look at the world, the way we do business, the things we care about, the agenda we take up, the priorities we have, what does it mean? Um, just a reminder, as if my super secret location at my office were not clue enough, I'm recording this earlier in the day. This is not live. And uh, I'm also not on Facebook right now. But if you leave a comment, you have a question, or you can text me or call me or email me or whatever you want to do. Uh, but even if you leave a comment, I'm sure that um, Jerry or Ronnie or one of the others that are on Facebook that monitor the church pages will uh, get that question or comment back to me. And we can have a conversation about it. But right now, I want you to just spend some time in Exodus. Spend some time looking at the nature of God and how the Exodus narrative ties God's action in the book of Exodus together with a fundamental aspect of his character. And what does it mean for us to follow him? All right. I hope you guys have a good Thanksgiving, and we will talk to you later.